Dear friends, welcome to e-Pathshala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Peet Pune. Today we are going to look at a module titled Governmentality and the Patron Client State. What do we understand by the term patron client? What do we understand by this whole idea of Jajmani that was present during the pre-colonial and even during the colonial period? Is this system exploitative? Does this system engage in power relationships? Are the patrons and the clients related to each other through kinships? This particular module will try and discuss how Indian democracy enables forms of patronage and it enables client and patron relationships to survive because of the peculiar distribution of power in the Indian democracy. The patron client relationship model. A patron client formation consists of networks of didactic relations centered on power figures, the patrons who control the resources essential to the survival and well being of the dependent groups, the clients. Such a social formation cross cuts class and primordial ties such as caste and provides a framework for organizing activity at the local level and articulating it with wider society. People of disparate status, wealth and power are vertically integrated below patrons who in turn may be clients of patrons at higher levels. Patrons and clients may interact on several dimensions, economic, political and ritual that take in whole person. The patron-client relationship is enduring and often involves the following structural features. Heredity ties between families, mutual trust, confidence, mutual expectations, community support of values and conception of moral bond. The patron-client formation finds its fullest elaboration where there are gaps between a state's center and periphery. This implies situations of localized power and organization of production and distribution based on local sources. In short, in situations of local political economy and subsistence economy, also implied is the distance of national and state institution. Although they may help define, support and regulate local arrangements and are in turn dependent on an upward flow of resources on which the state apparatus rests. In this arrangement, there is the local absence of impersonal, that is state enforced guarantees for physical security, status and wealth. The main reasons for the development of such relations is to provide security for both patron and client. The patron-client system is thus a paradoxical set of elements combining inequality and asymmetry in power with mutual solidarity and a combination of potential coercion and exploitation with voluntary relations and compelling mutual obligations. Thus, although there are rights and obligations on both sides, the relationship of patronage is an asymmetrical one in which there is inherent element of exploitation. The system can be quite brutal especially to those at the bottom, although dependent groups may receive little more than enough to feed them, clothe and shelter their assets for patrons. Given the dynamics of local autonomy and subsistence economy, the tendency is to give rights of participation and share to all, however unequal or minimal in the community's economic life. The sociology of patron-client relations. The analysis of patron-client exchanges was essentially developed to record and explain the repeated exchanges between patrons and clients who were distinguished by status, power or other characteristics. Patronage first came to the fore of the social sciences in the 1960s and 1970s, mainly in Mediterranean and Latin American peasant studies. It was given theoretical importance in the West by scholars such as Ernest Gellner, Eisenstadt, Eric Wolf and James Scott. Since then, patronage has been an important concept in anthropology and political science especially. In early liberal conventional understandings, patronage was seen as a residual element in the acceptable structuring of social, political and economic outcomes. 
patronage was a regressive force inimical to democracy, civil society and the market's free flow. Patronage in this literature was a means of exploitation, a vestige of feudalism, a governmental pathology, a politics of the poor or an ancillary institution. It was never been a site of positive value in its own right. Patronage appeared as a cause or symptom of political infirmity. It was portrayed as a retrograde, oppressive or at best ancillary institution destined to vanish the moment modern democratic states take proper hold of the world. Time and again, analysts forecast its disappearance, time and again lamenting its refusal to go away. Marxist scholars saw patronage as a sentimentalization of class inequality. For them, patronage was a myth or the ideology of the elites endorsed by those social analysts who dared to present it as anything but power struggle. The language of kinship, friendship and sympathy they claim concealed behind it the brutal mechanism of dependence and exploitation. Sociologist Anthony Hall, for example, wrote that however one may approach patronage, the important fact is the inherently coercive nature of patron clientage. Later, anthropological and political science studies began to challenge the liberal and Marxist narratives and argue that patronage was not everywhere plainly bad news. Patron-client relationships did not necessarily propagate inequality or sent modern politics back into feudal darkness, but often achieved the obverse, social mobility and political participation. It was argued that we face not a feudal residue, but a current political form vital in its own right. That patronage cannot be seen unchanging timeless phenomena, a transactional arrangement with a fixed and predetermined content. Rather, we need to see it as a living moral idiom that carries much of the life, especially in South Asian politics and society at large. Ties of patronage might assist the poor to wrest resources from the elites or help immigrants access state services. Political sciences took a kinder view of clientelism and argued that patron-client exchanges were not confined to pre-modern societies, but in fact frequently took place in societies well on the way to becoming modern and which had many modern institutions. Patron-client relationships formed the backbone of traditional politics and were seen as the main political tool of tribal presence and the urban poor. That patronage and electoral politics often went hand in hand. Patronage promoted electoral participation, which in turn generated fresh patronage bonds. As modern politics spread into far corners of society and the globe, patronage became a link between the governments and social peripheries, culturally unfit or otherwise excluded from direct engagement with the state. Because patronage connected bureaucracies to traditional politics, cities to villages and governments to citizens through patron politicians and broker bureaucrats, it could paradoxically modernize developing states. In a context where the emerging capitalist system does not enjoy political stability and general acceptance, where the state is not strong enough to enforce order by force, and where civil society is failing to create the ideological support for the emergence of capitalism, Patron-client networks which organize payoffs to most vociferous opponents of the system are an effective, if costly, way of maintaining political stability. In India, we have had studies of kinship in uh, the history of colonial relations, ethnographies of village studies, and big men in urban centers. And the more recent work on fixers, which have all focused centrally on patronage. In this module, we will focus on the study of agrarian and intercaste relations, the Jajmani system and its variations, the local level politics and other forms which deal with vertical dependency of groups and individuals based on unequal distribution of resources. In an era of classic ethnography, 1930s to 1980s, South Asia's anthropologists focused chiefly on the Jajmani system of intercaste village exchange. Mandelbaum, 1970 and Dumont 1980. In the ideal Jajmani model, each village revolved around a land-owning patron family, the Jajman. Each service caste, the Kamin, performed a unique economic and ritual role. Priests conducted rituals, sweepers swept floors, barbers shaved beers, and each caste in return received payments and gifts along with a share of the village harvest. 
This was what anthropologists termed total exchange after Marcel Moss. At once economic, political, ritual and moral which constituted multi-dimensional social bond. The Jajmani studies argued that in South Asia, patronage was never a purely economic or top-down power relation. Crucially, it was a relation of status difference. Status asymmetry in relation was expressed in the language of services and gifts, terms which define the normative principles organizing the relationship and identities of those involved. The donor-servant relationship was profoundly mutual and socially constitutive bond in which all participants were defined relative one another. One was never simply a drummer, barber or a priest, but a drummer, barber or priest forth for this or that patron. Servants in turn maintain the patron's ritual purity, authorizing the preeminence and the authority through which they ruled. Both ritually and economically, servants turned landholders into patrons. In their turn, patrons passed down their identities to the servants together with the payments and gifts. Jan Bremen's landmark study of the Halpati system in South Gujarat, Chikligam Gandevigam, gives a useful and detailed picture of the functioning of patron-client system in agrarian rural India. He studied the patron-client relations between Anavil Brahmin landholders who lived in the village center and the tribal Halpati a caste of agricultural labourers also known as Dublas, a much larger population which lived in self-built mud huts on the outskirts. The relationship between the Anavil Brahmins and Dublas were characterised traditionally by patronage and exploitation. The Anavil master kept as many servants as he could, not merely to get more work done, but also in order to enhance his prestige and power. People sought to increase their wealth in order to increase the number of their dependents. While Anavil Dhanim Amo aspired to have many servants, the Dubla Hali could have only one master. A Dubla entered into a relationship of servitude with an Anavil through a debt, which characteristically went to pay for the Dubla's marriage. The debt was such that it could normally not be repaid in his lifetime. As Bremen shows, it was in fact a legal fiction manipulated by the master as long as it was to his advantage. In the traditional setup, pre-independence, the Hali relationship was of some advantage to the servant and not just to the master. Although the advantages were different in the two cases, no matter how low the level at which he was maintained, the Dubla was assured a measure of security by the relationship into which he entered. Thus, compared to unattached Dublas, the Halis were in a marginally superior condition. Independence actually solidified the power of the landowners. They became more dominant than they had been before. In the 50s, after the very modest Congress Tenancy Act, land was supposed to revert to some extent to the tillers. In these villages, the lower caste coolies lost the land, but the Anavils kept theirs, with average holdings of 10 to 20 acres, including most of the richest soils. Ultimately, the Halapathis benefited in no way at all from the land reforms. The few tenant farmers, among them generally lost the land they had sharecropped on an informal basis. The reforms were designed and implemented in such a way that the share of the land owned by land poor farmers was given priority above allocating plots of land to the landless masses. Anavils also captured the local credit cooperatives and the panchayats, the village councils. The Dublas had numerical strength but no real political power. In fact, devolution of governance to village level has hardened the hegemony of the upper caste landowners. The system was finally broken down at the initiative of the Anavils or rather when it ceased to be consistent with their interests. The Anavils initiated a new pattern of cultivation based on fruit crops, mainly mango and more recently chiku in which the requirements of labour are different from those in the old. The new crops are profitable up to a point, but more important, according to Bremen, is the fact that the cultivation gives the Anavils greater leisure to pursue a more highly esteemed style of life. The Dublas appear to have come off rather worse than they were. They have lost much of the security they enjoyed without gaining an appreciably better standard of living. 
they cannot now find all the employment they required within the village and have to look for it outside. But they cannot depend on outside employment for a full year and have to return to the village for part of the year. Many of the Dublas of Chikligam now lead a transhuman existence, abandoned by the former masters and yet partly dependent on them. Thus, though patronage is clearly breaking down, it does not necessarily lead to a decrease or an increase in exploitation. In the endeavor of the members of the dominant caste to attain more esteem and influence within and outside the village, the Dublas have been changed from subjects into objects. Governmentality and the developmentalist Indian state. The concept of governmentality was introduced by Michel Foucault to differentiate it from the traditional logic of power that is sovereignty. For Foucault, modernity entails the emergence of governmental forms of power. What government has to do with is not territory but rather a sort of complex composed of men and things. The things with which in this sense government is to be concerned are in fact men but men in their relations, their links, their imbrication with those other things which are wealth, resources, means of subsistence, the territory with its specific qualities, climate, irrigation, fertility, men in their relation to other kinds of things, customs, habits, etc. Partha Chatterjee argues that the history of governmentality in Global South is quite different as a result of the colonial encounter. In the West, the story of citizenship moves from the institution of civic rights in civil society to political rights in the fully developed nation state and only then developing the techniques of governmentality. But that order was reversed in the colonies where the technologies of governmentality, example anthropometry in India, often predate the nation state. Looking at India, one also finds that early governmental practices, including those of rational bureaucracy, rule of law, and the knowledge of populations were motivated mainly by politics. It was the creation and maintenance of the sovereign power of British colonial authority that was the objective. Chatterjee notes that in the 19th century, notions of liberal governmentality were introduced by officials influenced by utilitarian ideas to make India society the target of policy in order to improve productivity as well as morality. Indian nationalists in the 20th century rejected colonial governmentality and demanded full rights of sovereignty over the state. However, the post-colonial state retained the colonial apparatus of security based on real politics while expanding liberal governmentality to include an agenda of welfare of the people. In the more recent period, the spread of governmentality alongside the politics of electoral representation has produced in India forms of claim making and resistance that go well beyond Foucault's framework. Post-colonial states in recent times thus have deployed the latest governmental technologies to promote the well-being of their populations, often prompted and aided by international and non-governmental organizations. Chatterjee chronicles in details how the spread of governmental technologies in India in the last three decades have transformed the rural and agrarian sphere. There is a growing sense now that certain basic conditions of life must be provided to people everywhere and that if the national or local governments do not provide them, someone else must, whether it is other states or international agencies or non-governmental organizations. As a result of the deepening reach of the developmental state under conditions of electoral democracy, the land reforms, even though gradual and piecemeal, the state is no longer an external entity to the peasant community. Governmental agencies distributing education, health services, food, roadways, water, electricity, agricultural technology, emergency relief and dozens of other welfare services have penetrated into the interior of everyday peasant life. Not only are peasants dependent on the state agencies for their services, they have also acquired considerable skill, albeit to a different degree in different regions in manipulating and pressurizing these agencies to deliver these benefits. Institutions of state or at least government agencies, whether state or non-state, have become internal aspects of the peasant community. Chatterjee also notes that this governmentality has been crucial in countering the effects of primitive accumulation unleashed by capital transformation in rural India. He notes how governmental agencies have to find the resources to 
as it were reverse the consequences of primitive accumulation by providing alternative means of livelihood to those who have lost them. The passive revolution under conditions of electoral democracy make it unacceptable and illegitimate for the government to leave these marginalized populations without the means of labor to simply fend for themselves. That carries the risk of turning them into dangerous classes. It is not uncommon for developmental states to protect certain sectors of production that are currently the domain of peasants, artisans and small manufacturers against competition from large corporate firms. Hence a whole series of governmental policies are being and will be devised to reverse the effects of primitive accumulation. Thus, as in other countries, government agencies in India provide some direct benefits to people who because of poverty or other reasons are unable to meet the basic consumption need. This could be in the form of special poverty removal programs or schemes of guaranteed employment in public works or even directly delivery of subsidized or free food. Thus, there are programs of supplying subsidized food grains to those designated as Bureau Poverty Line, guaranteed employment up to 100 days in a year for those who need it and free meals to children in primary schools. There are many examples in many countries including India of governments and non-government agencies offering easy loans to enable those without means of sustenance to find gainful employment. All these may be regarded for Chatterjee as direct interventions to reverse the effect of primitive accumulation. Changing patron-client system in India. Barry Mishi looks at the transformation of patron-client relationship in two villages of Rajasthan in India, mainly due to the changes induced through development programs and politico-administrative reforms. He examines the system's transformation in terms of the changing institutional properties and attendant shifts in its rational logic imperatives, arguing that a multi-purpose patron-client system is not incompatible with these new circumstances. He says we do not see demise of patron-client relationship per se, but of it taking a new form. The old patron-client system does not move towards a new equilibrium point with changes on the order of simple additions to or replacement of content within elements. Rather, the very relations that characterize it internally and externally with its environment undergo change with elements added and others deleted. They not only move the local system towards integration with higher levels but also replace the old with a new set of relations, purposes and evaluation criteria at the local level. With the active Im involvement of the state and national government in local affairs, patron-client structures are forced to respond to a new set of circumstances like the introduction of commercialized agriculture during Green Revolution, state and national electoral national politics development, administration and institutional reform. The traditional patron-client system tended to address how all people make a livelihood, are integrated into social life and obtain security. The new system narrowly restricts this dimension to specific groups, particularly landowners, who are the only ones who can make use of agricultural development resources, the new major currency of patronage land agricultural development, employment and produce are removed from the patronage networks due to a change in the calculus of production and distribution wrought by commercialization. As a result, patron-client clusters become differentiated, focused on single interest and lose their all-purpose function of integrating all groups into production and distribution. The influx of inside resources adds patronage to be dispensed but also creates a new dependency on the outside links. The effect is loss of autonomy in the system. This diminishes the patron's monopoly unless they can capture control of the new resources as through winning elected office and or bargaining local political support for resources distributed by politicians and administrators at higher levels. As a result, Patrons become less subject to local structural constraints as they turn to and become dependent on outside resources and support. This changes the local power equations as they become le less dependent on clients for personal support. Patrons are also presented with alternative 
uses other than patronage for their personal resources. These increasingly do not have to be or cannot be shared with clients as patrons enter commercialized production and become subjects of its imperatives. Given the lack of alternative sources of income and diminishing access to productive resources, dependent groups are even more dependent on whatever little they receive from patrons. Currently, patrons' bargaining position are strong vis-a-vis -vis clients and those at higher levels. Similarly, politicians and policy makers at higher levels must listen to the local elites and cater to their demands if they want to retain their positions. Accordingly, clients become liabilities instead of assets in the operation of the patron's personal enterprise. Clients do remain important, however, on the political dimension. But to enlist their support, patronage shifts to the distribution of public goods and services. Controlled by political parties and administration, collective goods such as schools and health centers are used to appeal to various client goods but these do not provide widespread employment opportunities. In fact, many of these things build an infrastructure from which clients do not, but others will derive benefits. Similarly, non-agricultural divisible goods such as housing loans and scholarships help the life chances of but a select few. They may be paralyzed into a productive income earning asset, but the spread effect is minimal. The centripetal force of commercialization is strengthened by non-local sources of legitimacy and support for the local elite. Neither can they nor need they be concerned about the welfare of dependent groups and garnering their personal support as under traditional conditions. And what clients demand stand as a threat to patron personal enterprises. The only thing clients have to offer is votes for which they receive minimal payoffs. Mishi argues that thus, the changes introduced by the developmental state take place on a social base market marked by inequality. Without addressing the imbalance, the initial and subsequent movement is towards greater inequality, concentration and polarization as the few in dominant positions disproportionately reap the benefits of change. In this module, therefore, we have seen how, for instance, Jan Bremen's work on the Anavil Brahmins and the Halpatis, where the Anavil Brahmins have been the patrons for so many decades and the Halpatis or the Dublas have worked as the clients or as bonded laborers. This kind of feudalism is not difficult to find even today in some parts of rural India or even in urban areas. However, it is also argued by some scholars that this patron-client relationship enables democracy to function well. However, we also have seen how there is a power relationship in this whole process and practice of patron-client relationship. Thank you.